Okay, I think we can start. Uh, first of all, welcome back to Ask Sakael uh, 2020. My name is Nissim, and before we start, I would like to cover a couple of points. Uh, first of all, this session is being recorded and will be shared on OASP Israel YouTube channel if you need to get back to it. Uh, we'll have five to ten minutes for Q&A at the end of the session, so feel free to drop any question on the chat. I also would like to thank our gold sponsors, Amdocs and Checkmark. Link to their website can be found on the chat and also on the AppSec Israel uh, website. Um, okay, so let's get down to business. Our next talk is Find Bugs Faster with Fuzzing uh, by our special guest, Mr. Alper Basharan. Uh, joining us from Ankara, Turkey. Alper, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I hope to be able to provide you with some interesting information today. And hopefully, um, you will profit from this as much as we did as a penetration testing company. So uh, we could say that we'll have two basic parts. Uh, the first part where I'll be going over the topic. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you may not. And then we'll get down to business with a few uh, hands-on applications. Uh, my name is Alper. I'm from Turkey, as mentioned. I've been working as a penetration tester now for over 15 years. and. Uh, I'll get to it, but fuzzing has helped me a lot. I have three books published, unfortunately, in Turkish. And I have founded a company some eight years ago named Sparta. Today, we'll cover the basics of fuzzing, where we will uh, incorporate this in our testing procedure and uh, application security procedure as well. And I do have, in fact, three web applications that I found online. Uh, um, where we would be able to see how uh, effective fuzzing is. Just to uh, go over, please take the zero day uh, term with a grain of salt. These are very low profile applications, uh, but as far as I know, nothing has been reported to exploit DB yet. So that's the extent of uh, the zero day uh, in that sense. Well, these applications are a hotel booking application, a car rental, rent a car application, and a basic student result management system. Uh, all these three applications are from the same place, uh, these guys. Apparently, they are also selling these applications, so they are not really meant to be vulnerable applications as we would usually have with uh, Uh, demo vulnerable web, web application and the like. So uh, hopefully we'll get lucky with these. This is our general approach to penetration testing. We are trying to uncover the weaknesses. This is a quote from uh, a book and there was also a movie titled after it, Ender's Game. And basically we are trying to uncover bugs before the, the bad guys do. But there's another quote that could be more fitting for fuzzing. Uh, sorry about that. Here's the translation. It says the fox knows many tricks, but a hedgehog only one, and it's an important trick. So going back to fuzzing, yes, we do all do have our own methodologies for penetration testing, for source code review. I'll get into that shortly. But fuzzing can be uh, life-saving in many situations. That's why. It's um, a technique that I use quite often, and I'm very fond of it. It's not a new approach. It has been uh, on the market for years and years. Even in the, back in the uh, 1950s, they were trying to uh, break things by sending it whatever it was not expecting. So uh, back then, they were doing this with punch cards. Today, we, are, we will be using a bunch of different tools to do that. But, the mentality didn't change that much. What are we trying to do, really? We usually do have our application that we are trying to understand or to uncover vulnerabilities for. And then we would have our regular vulnerabilities. These are the things that we will try to find out. But when we are talking about fuzzing, 
In fact, it's the errors and the crashes that would uh, tell us what's going on and how it's going on. So from a, a strictly fuzzing approach, this might be uh, more applicable. We see the errors, the crashes or no responses or something different, something that changes based on what we are sending out. And then we can go ahead and exploit these. So um, it's not having two different outputs. Okay, this thing causes an error, so we will need to fix it. In our approach, since we are penetration testers, we are trying to find where that uh, particular error or uh, crash would lead. It could be a buffer overflow, it could be an SQL injection, depending on the situation. So not only monitoring the errors, but also trying to understand where these would fit in, uh, in a regular scheme. We basically have two main approaches where uh, these are called uh, mutation-based and generated. In one case, we take the input that has to be sent, that the, the application is expecting, and we are slightly changing it. So maybe we have an ID user, and what happens if I try to user two or admin or administrator, and it, does anything change? And then we will be sending things that are not really what the application expects, uh, payloads or uh, fuzzing uh, content that would be generated by us. So the, the, the application is expecting a user. What happens if I send a number? What happens if I try to direct traversal? And this would be called generated. So in penetration tester, we are in testing, we are trying to find vulnerabilities. And as you might be familiar, we do have several different approaches. So white box, black box, and gray box. White box being the most open one where we should, according to NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technologies special publication, uh, we should have access to the source code as well. And then on the other end uh, of the spectrum, we do have black box penetration testing where we don't have any access at all to the, the back end of the application and gray box, which sits uh, between the two. So where does penetration testing sit in the whole software development life cycle or, or secure um, software development life cycle? Microsoft tells us it's incorporated in this uh, cycle. So it's part of the process. And as you can see here, in fact, it's part of different steps of the same process. But what happens in real life? This is the replica of a mail that I got last month. And uh, it seems that every month or every two weeks, I get a mail like this from a customer. And here you can see that uh, it was the, the IT department was called off guard because the marketing department decided, decided to launch a, a promotional website. And the launch date is tomorrow. And they are just expecting us to do a penetration test. OK, thanks. Bye. Uh, Unfortunately, the situation might be different in your countries, but in Turkey, we still have some education to do on uh, towards the market. So we have to uh, explain people that that's not really how the penetration testing process works. It's not something that I just check and, okay, you're good to go. Uh, but it so happens that uh, every now and then we find ourselves in this uh, situation. Maybe you've experienced something similar. And this is by far the place where we have found that fuzzing uh, helps us a lot. So in most of the cases, this penetration testing and security test will be forgotten, will be lost. We have customers that are startups and that got uh, Series A, Series B's investment and still didn't have uh, proper penetration testing done on their uh, application. So sometimes you forget it sometimes we just don't have the money the time the energy to do it and we forget you all know since you it's an OWASP event you all, all are familiar with this um, graphic i presume penetration testing tells us to uncover the risks and if possible the business impacts as well on, on the application regarding any potential vulnerabilities 
but we sometimes forget that penetration testing has its limitations. Time being um, the first one, as we, just, we have just seen. Even if the customer doesn't really have a, a deadline like the, the previous one, we still, or they still expect us to give them a proper project plan. Okay, how long will it take? Four weeks, okay. Um, but if we think that about the situation in real life, attackers or criminal hackers will have unlimited time to test the application after we have, we, okay, we have tested the application for four weeks, for six weeks, for 10 weeks, but the guys will have years maybe to do that. And it will be a cumulative effort. So one guy from India will be checking for cross-site scripting. The other guy randomly from Germany will be looking for SQL injection and the like. So it's not methodology, it's not following the same methodology as we do, but odds or chances are they will find more bugs than we did because they would have more time and uh, probably people attacking the application will be specialized in a certain aspect of it. Resources are also scarce. As I said, once we open the application to the internet, attacks will be coming from all around the world, not just from a single point. And uh, it can be considered as unlimited resources. Whereas, you know, our company, we are 10 guys trying to do something or 20 or 40, no matter what the size of the company is really because the attacker is uh, outnumbers us. And we also have this uh, Murphy code. Um, maybe you are familiar with Murphy laws and you know, he, he says that not, don't forget your weapon was manufactured by the lowest uh, bidder. Same thing for penetration testing. The job uh, will probably uh, go to the lowest offer. So uh, the quality of the penetration testing might be also questionable in that sense. Uh, did I mention time? Yes, I did. Okay, that, these are the limitations of penetration testing. Then someone could say, okay, just don't test it if you are so uh, whiny about it, if you start crying about it, give us a source code review. Again, some problems with that, we will require access to source code review. We are still fighting with customers uh, on that. You know, the, the developers don't always volunteer to give out their uh, source codes. And basically, uh, I will be sharing the slides, by the way, if you follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, I, I'll be sharing the slides and you can reach them from there. Basically what source code does, yes, we have a bunch of tools that are commercial, open source and, and the like, but it's basically uh, a glorified cat and grep process. It's looking for some functions. Yes, it will maybe follow the, the data flow or the input flow or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's just reading the code, just like we would do. Then there's the problem of third party libraries, modules. Sometimes, yes, we do have access to the apl application source code, but there is one library that is not available for source code review. What do we do then? And comments are really, uh, sometimes problematic depending on what tool you use. Every single line of comment can be in interpreted as um, hard-coded credential. And then someone will go over uh, the results and try to eliminate the, the false positives. And at the end on the, of the day, these are only potential vulnerabilities, okay? Maybe the function was not used properly, okay? The input was not sanitized, okay, perfect. but does it lead to something? This is also, uh, we will have to check this manually at the end of the day. So source code review, very effective, but it's again, not the answer to all our questions. And fuzzing for me just uh, stands a bit in the middle between penetration testing, a full scope methodological uh, penetration testing and uh, source code review in case we don't have access to source code review or time is very limited as we have just seen an example for, um, then that's where we would go with uh, further. Our goal is to find errors or insecurities. It's not an elegant technique. No, I'll give you that. It's uh, sending everything you can to the application, 
hoping that it will crash or it will return something that it shouldn't. And based on that, you will have to develop a, a payload or something. But it is extensively used, maybe if you are coming from a software testing background or you have had the experience in that area, people are testing that. And one way to test software, not for security vulnerabilities, but for um, um, general software tests or unit tests, quality control tests and fuzzing will be used uh, as well. As we have seen for penetration testing and source code review, fuzzing also has its limitations. For example, if you don't really understand how the application works and you rely only on the fuzzer's responses, then you might miss some critical uh, things. Let's say that we are sending, uh, we are trying to uh, reach uh, or to discover uh, all the directories and files and folders that we can reach. Okay, perfect. So a normal request to a directory that doesn't exist will return a 404, right? Okay, perfect. But if we rely solely on the results of the tools, then for example, like in this case, if you get a 404, but not from a user accessible page, but from a page that should be only accessible to the admins, it means that you can reach that area. It's just not just the right file and folder name. You will miss that. You'll just see a 404 like the rest of the request and uh, you might miss that. Also, you might not find things like um, logical flows or others. Um, in this case, if you are really trying to have a buffer or flow or you're trying to crash the application for a reason or another, you might have a successful login due to hard-coded credentials and you'll also miss that because the application will not crash it will just log in and uh, your fuzzer will keep working again limitations of fuzzing it will not give you the whole pictures it will just tell you what you're trying to find out and if you're not really sure about what you're trying to find out then like these two examples you might miss a couple of things then of course, you'll have to manually see the exploitability. Trying this on live systems might be dangerous. We have had um, some <laughs> unfortunate experience with uh, shipping docks where they couldn't load ships for a certain amount of time. And you'll definitely miss any complex vulnerability that would require one or two or more vulnerabilities used together to achieve for example, if you do have something like uh, remote file inclusion and then uh, some cross-site scripting or uh, IDOR or something, and you have to use them together to achieve remote code execution, then you will miss this. Fuzzing will not give you the answer for, for that. Uh, as I mentioned, quality testers use fuzzing just to make sure that the application works as it should, that um, it can handle a certain number of visitors, for example, for a website, or the application can handle a certain, certain number of requests. It's something that is, is used regularly. We should just now look at it from a, a security perspective. Of course, we will try to uncover threats for confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which is in fact, uh, security as one might uh, put it very lightly but our main goal would be to find hostile data so any data that would lead to some compromise or vulnerability we can find of course uh, design errors such as authentication bypass or execution errors like buffer overflows or uh, just configuration flows just uh, yesterday, we had a case where the config.php file was open, wide open to the internet and uh, the credentials were in that file. Found with fuzzing, of course, we, there's no way we could have guessed uh, the beginning of that uh, URL. What is hostile data? Basically, you can just think of it as special characters that would crash or cause a malfunction uh, in the application mostly special characters. So you will find things like uh, commands or uh, ampersands that would help you add a second command. Of course, you know, the single code that would break a, a SQL request. 
uh, an SQL query. All these can result and may result in a vulnerability. So one of the goals would be to understand which of these uh, bad characters or special characters cause the problem and you know, develop an attack based on that. Um, we, are, we will not limit ourselves to only this set of characters, obviously. We will also try to see what different types of files the application accepts. If I go and monkey around with the file metadata or the headers or uh, the HTML, HTML method, what happens then? These are all things that we will try to, to find out. But basically, we can say that we have our fuzzer and we have a target on the other side. And the idea is quite simple, quite straightforward, is to try to figure out what results in an unexpected response. So, okay, I'm used to getting 404s. What did I send that caused this uh, 543 and maybe uh, caused a problem with the server? This would be our main goal. This is what we're trying to understand. Believe it or not, fuzzing does have its own methodology. Uh, it's a bit, uh, you know, when we talk about fuzzing, it's like, as I said, monkeys sending things or, um, you know, monkeys typing the, on a typewriter. Yes, they could randomly hit a, a word or maybe write a sentence, but it will be just uh, out of sheer luck just to minimize this luck factor and to have something that is repeatable and something that could help us for uh, in order to further develop our vulnerability or exploit in that sense we need to set everything into a methodology and this would be basically uh, the fuzzing methodology first we will try to identify the targets depending on if it's um, Google might be a way to do that if it's a huge target. Say I'm trying to find something in uh, Tesla or uh, any other pro uh, bug bounty program. Or maybe if I only have one application that the customer sent me to, to test, then yes, first I will have to find the target. And then I will have to identify the inputs. Where can I send an input? What can I change? What can I fuzz to have a certain result. Then we will need to generate data. For most of the cases, when it comes to web applications, we do have huge data sets online. I, I've shared a few examples in, in this presentation. You can see the links there. Or maybe you could generate your own data and see what happens. Then it's uh, the fuzzing part. It can take some time if you are fuzzing. For example, if someone decided to go ahead and uh, fuzz the latest Apache uh, web server, then you might need some computing power and you will need probably time in order to find a bug that is relevant for you. Same thing goes for if you are trying to fuzz a Word or uh, the Windows calculator, for example. But if you have applications that have been uh, written more lightly, then uh, probably it won't take that much time. And based on the results of the fuzzing, we will monitor the anomalies. What happened that the application responded differently? What changed? What caused this uh, anomaly? This is what we are trying to, to understand. And if we are talking about web applications, then any change for us is relevant. The error code, yes. Um, the content of the page that is returned, yes. Anything, the size of the response, the number of characters, any change, any albeit small, for us would be uh, an important clue for the next um, fuzzing. Because here, I've just streamlined the process. It might seem that we just uh, go over in a single line. However, we, um, in real life, after the execution and we have uh, monitored the anomalies, we will need to go back to our data set and change it and maybe uh, customize it based on the anomaly that we have found. For example, I first use WFuzz. This is the approach I'll take for the applications that we'll be testing now. I'm using WFuzz and I'm using the all attacks word list. I'll get into that in a short while. 
Okay, which is the character that most likely calls the different response? It's a single code. Okay, go back to generate data, and now I'll use only the SQL injection payload list and see what happens. If it's a login screen, same thing. Do I have a payload list for uh, login bypasses with SQL injection? Yes, I do. Then I'll be using it. So this part is a bit, uh, should be considered like a cycle where I go back to my data based on the anomalies I find. And then once I'm clear about what could be there, I will just uh, check or look for the exploitability. And in real life, it would be pretty much the same approach. I just first look at what uh, the client sends to the application. The, do I have an, a parameter in the URL? Is it a post parameter? I don't have any parameter, then I'm left to play with, for example, user agent values or HTTP methods, depending on what. And then based on my uh, payload, I would get hopefully some different responses. And then uh, special characters for us would be important. This is the case for vulnerabilities such as uh, HTTP request smuggling and the like, as you might know. And at the end of the day, it's just a matter of checking the anomalies and trying to figure out how I can use that. We will be fuzzing everything. As I said, the HTTP method, uh, data, user agent, cookies. If I'm uploading a file, even the file metadata would be for us something to fuzz, something to, to play uh, around with. Again, this will change based on the application and how the application and uh, the, the client talk to each other based on the number of headers that I'm sending out which, with each request and uh, maybe looking at the responses I get from uh, the server. A few quick reminders. Yes, it will. we will be working with requests and responses. That's how uh, the internet works. Special characters in uh, URLs might be encoded or we might need to encode them just to make sure that they reach the server or the application uh, correctly. So a query string. Yes, I have tried all my payloads with a question mark then. Now let's try them with the URL encoded version. Again, uh, methods, you might have heard of some uh, HTTP methods, but just to give you an idea about uh, the, the fuzzing approach, these are the list of the HTTP methods that we will be using while fuzzing. Here you will see the usual get, post, put, add, delete, patch options, uh, probably things that a basic need to can would tell you that the target supports uh, trace options and then you might have this kind of vulnerability. Okay, good, but what happens if I send something out unbind, for example? What, what does the application do? The better our payload list or our data set is, the more chances we have of having uh, relevant or interesting results. Otherwise, it would be, uh, well, we'll just be trying to achieve something without really uh, having an impact. HTTP response codes, what the application is trying to tell me will also be important. As I said, these are quick reminders, but if I get some a code that starts with uh, 200, then yeah, probably everything goes as planned, no worries. But if I get 300, I redirect a 400, that will be a client error, so it's uh, my bad. and. and 500 error would be something wrong with the server. As you will guess, 300, 400, and 500 would usually be those that would be interesting for us. When we analyze all possible potential vulnerabilities that could affect a web application, we see that at the end of the day, it's just a matter of, for most of them, maybe 95% of them, just a matter of input output validation. If some controls, some checks are not done on the client and on the server side, then yes, you might have a vulnerability or uh, hopefully uh, an exploit. And at this stage, it's important for us to understand how the guys who developed the application did that. They might have 
two approaches, a blacklist approach where they have a list of everything they don't want to see. That would be your regular uh, then vulnerable web application, medium level uh, security uh, measures. Like, yes, if you see script, then this guy is trying to have a cross-site scripting and block it. Okay, good. But what we advise people is to use a whitelist approach so that you know they they don't miss anything that is encoded or written differently and and the like if they have a input validation on the server side with whitelist then probably you should not uh, lose so much time on trying to to fuzz it and probably look at more intelligent ways to do that uh, as i mentioned fuzzing will have its limitation and business logic uh, vulnerabilities or flaws are not among the things that you will find using fuzzing. So if you fuzz and fuzz and there's nothing, then that's where you have to, to start looking. A few tools that we will shortly go over. HTTP Live Header is always good. It's an add-on. I'm using it on Firefox. Most probably they have it on Chrome as well. You'll have to check that. But whatever page I'm visiting, it helps me see what's going on with the application, what I'm sending. And if I see a parameter, then I can say, okay, oh, let's pause that. Normally you would have Burp Suite on and intercepting the request, of course, but uh, you cannot have it on all the time. And sometimes it's not as easy to set up and sometimes you're just lazy. So HTTP headers live is a good add-on to have. Cookie Quick, Ma Quick Manager will also have its place. Why? Because once you start fuzzing, uh, you will need cookies, especially for sites that uh, have a login. Once you're logged in, then you will need these cookies. It's an easy way to see what cookies were sent and uh, what cookies were set and which you do have on your uh, browser. And of course, uh, Burp Suite, we will be using it uh, to intercept uh, the requests and also the responses from the server and it will guide us through the main process. As you, you know, probably Burp Suite has a community edition and a professional edition. The community edition, unfortunately, is far too slow to conduct any significant fuzzing uh, test. That's why we will be using WFuzz, which would do this uh, much quicker compared to Burp Suite community edition. The professional version is not that bad, but again, uh, if you have really a huge list of uh, data or uh, payloads, then sticking with uh, WFuzz might be a quicker way to do that. We'll be using the intruder module for that. Um, and of course, you'll be able to read these in, on the slides. But there is a different approaches we can take. We'll be using the intruder. Uh, tool in Burp Suite for this. And depending on the number of um, parameters that you will fuzz, you might need to use something different uh, than Sniper here. Here, as you can see, I'll be just fuzzing uh, the HTTP method using uh, the, a list of all possible potential HTTP methods. And hopefully this will lead something interesting. For example, here we do have a case where I'm sending a request with a method ACL and I get a 501 not implemented and I get the server name Akamai Ghost. And I send a bind request. Again, I have a 400. It's the same request, by the way, I'm sending and responses changes. So with one, I have a 501 not implemented. With the other one, I have a 400 bad request. And with one of them, I have, yes, 500 internal server error, but but as you can see here, the server discloses its name, for example. And then it will be a matter of trying to find out, figure out if I can use this to crash the server, if I can use this for an SQL injection, a cross-site scripting, or um, an XML injection, depending on the situation. The main tool we will be using is WFuzz. Uh, I'm hoping you're already familiar or are using this tool in the context that I will show. In most of the 
ethical hacking, quote unquote trainings, you will see it's mainly used for things like directory discovery and the like. But we have seen it's working perfectly with um, fuzzing web applications. The usage is quite simple. Um, I just provide it with a word list, a da data set, and I just write capital. I just write capital fuzz where I want this data to be put. Lots of different uh, uh, options, interesting options. For example, I can hide using dash dash ac uh, specific type of re uh, response so if the normal request uh, response i'm expecting is 200 then there's no need for me in looking at 10000 or 100000 of 200 uh, responses maybe i will just hide them and see what else comes and you can save the whole thing using dash f to a file maybe to analyze later it's important to use it with verbose as much as we can as you can see here, I'm basically fuzzing the same thing and I'm not really sure what's going on if I don't use the dash V. Dash V will also provide me additional information such as redirect, but where does it redirect me? And based on that, maybe I can discover or uncover some information about the application. Follow would be also interesting. As we have just seen uh, here, I'm fuzzing fb.com dash fuzz it's just something very stupid i do have some 301s so redirect i can use dash dash follow as you can see on the left hand side all of my requests generate 301 so it's re redirecting me somewhere but if i follow i can see that only some of them result really in a 200 and the rest is are just 404s so i'm re being redirected but i'm being redirected to an uh, page not found page basically so it doesn't really work for me and of course you can use tools such as crunch and Qul to generate your own uh, word list uh, as i said wfuzz has quite um, a number of options uh, that could maybe help me read out the the results uh, more easily Yes, I'm going to upload the, the presentation. Okay, so before we run out of time, let's go to the good part, to the interesting part, where we will be hopefully playing around with these applications and see how we can uh, use fuzzing in, uh, in a pseudo real environment. As I said, I'm not aware that these applications are developed to be vulnerable. So, you know, since these guys are selling their applications, I'm hoping it's the real deal. The first application we have is just a basic hotel booking website. Uh, and here you can see that I'm using Foxy Proxy to have Burp intercept my request. I will just get rid of anything that was sent. Here you are. And I'll just start playing around with the application. And I'll keep my eye on what I'm sending and what I'm receiving. And what I'm looking for really are any possible parameters. Here, for example, this would be a very typical example. I don't really have a parameter in, in the request. So what I will do, I will just send this to intruder anyway and I'll just fuzz the get method. That would be the HTTP method. I will just add, uh, first of all, let's clear everything. And I just tell Burp what I'm trying to fuzz. And for my payload set, I will go about and choose HTTP method, which would load all potential and possible HTTP methods. And then I'll start my attack. It will just uh, promote the, the paid version. And here you can see the speed is very low. Now I have only 32 uh, requests that I'm sending. But if I was sending 32,000 or 320,000 requests, that would take a huge amount of time. That's why 
if you are limited to using the community version of Verb Suite, it's not really a good idea to do your fuzzing through it. And I will not wait until it finishes because I can see that something is changing here. There's only one method that uh, results in, in fact, there are two methods or three methods that result in different response lengths, but only one that results in a different status scope. All of these are in, important for me, by the way. So because it's easier, status code might be the first thing I check. So this was the request. It's my initial request, as you can see. But the only thing that changed is the HTTP method. So connect instead of get. And the response is yeah, 400 bad requests. OK. But what could be interesting for me is that it discloses information about uh, the server. So it's uh, working on localhost port 80, and this is the server and uh, the PHP version. Interesting information. Head usually will have a smaller packet size because that's what it does. As you will know, it's only requesting the header of the content, not the content itself. So that's nothing to be uh, really alarmed about. And then trace seems also to result in a very strange uh, re response to be analyzed. So. Although I don't have really a uh, parameter in my in this case, uh, fuzzing just the method helped me maybe uncover some information about. Uh, okay, I will just stop that. Perfect. And then I have this rooms and uh, facilities. Uh, Okay, don't don't do anything else. Let's go to online reservations. And reservation PHP again, nothing uh, really interesting. Here I do have the possibility for to find a check-in check-out date. I'll check the availability, but for me it's not really about the availability of the hotel. It's more about uh, what I'm sending. How the, are the parameters being used? And I will be using these uh, in fuzzing. So here I have two uh, parameters, check in and check out with dates. These can be fuzzed. So I'll just go back to W fuzz. As I said, it will be pretty straightforward. I will use W fuzz's own word list that comes with uh, Kali. W fuzz word list. And under injection, I have something called all attacks. This file will basically have the main types of attacks that you could expect that you could find. As you can see, it, it has some cross-site scripting, some directory traversal, some SQL injection payloads, uh, some command execution payload. And depending on how the application will respond to each of them, I might have uh, a way or a tip about what to do next. W fuzz with the dash W, I'll be uh, pointing out to the word list. I'll be using injection and all attack. And then what I will do is with dash D, because as we have seen, it was a post request. I will just be putting the, the post data here. And then that would be where our uh, URL goes. And what I have to do basically is just write fuzz anywhere I want the uh, W fuzz to fuzz. And then I will just copy the URL and we should be good to go. As you can see, it goes over all uh, the attack vectors and in some cases, you can see that the uh, you can see that the re response changes. So here, going back up, after a while you'll get to used to this if you are not already, and you will see that okay, a 200 code seems normal for this application, and the number of lines and the number of characters. 
then this should be, it has just sent an A and this is the result it got. So this can be considered as a baseline or a normal answer. And anything that is different, it could be uh, a different code, it could be a different num number of characters, for me would be something interesting to uh, investigate further. And here I can see that it seems to have some problems with the single code. So is this the beginning of a SQL injection? Yeah, we can also check that with uh, WFuzz. And here, instead of all attacks, now that I have a basic idea where this might go, I will use the SQL injection payloads and see if anything changes. Here I have a very regular, very basic uh, SQL injection payload. It doesn't seem to do anything, but here, dash SQL attempt one seems to result in something different or union select all the same. So what I'll be doing now is just going back to burp and using repeater, just check what really happens once I put this payload here. What response am I getting? So uh, it's like, yes? Our time is up. Uh, if Wait. you want to oh. finish, yeah. Okay, just let me go to the good part. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, as you can see, this is a false positive as far as fuzzing is concerned because the re re reply I'm getting is just, yeah, that your query didn't work. So let's uh, go over a more interesting example for maybe this uh, client login, a login page. Again, similar approach. I'll just put in uh, my mail address. This will be a failed login, obviously, because I don't know the, the login. Login failed, perfect. But now, as I do have uh, this failed login, this is what I'll be using uh, to fuzz. And maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get a, a login bypass very quickly. Since now I'm trying to achieve a login bypass, what I can do in fact is just go and use a payload specific to that. For example, I can have a list of all potential login bypasses using SQL injection. So this would be the, the list that I'll be using. And again, dash D for my uh, payload, I'll just tell it to fuzz this. And here goes our URL. And once I find which uh, payload seem to work, because here, as you can see, we have different responses. Uh, once I have an idea about which one might work, then it's back to me and I'll just try to understand if uh, this really works or no. Um, so I can just use it here. And once I go over it manually, uh, I can see that in fact, there is a really a bypass here. I didn't submit it to anywhere. If you're interested, you can go ahead and uh, share it with exploit DB. So the idea is to use uh, basically fuzzing to show us a way about what to look for and how to look uh, for these things. It has helped us reduce our time, our testing time, especially in cases where the customer is expecting urgent re responses, is there a problem with my application? And fuzzing can help us tell them, yes, there is, or no, it looks fine, but you know, launch the application, but let us keep testing it. It has saved some time in that sense as well. Uh, okay, before anyone shoots me, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for attending. I'll be sharing the slides and um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me.
Okay, Alpar, we have one question from okay. Lior. Can you see it in the Q&A? Yes. Okay. Yes, this is the, the good part about uh, fuzzing. You don't really need to understand how all this works. So you don't really need to understand how SQL injection union payloads are uh, made. You can just have a list of everything that would uh, go wrong, that can be used to go wrong, like the all attack uh, payloads I have shown, and just launch them and see if anything changes. If nothing changes, probably you're good. If something changes, then it might mean something is wrong. So uh, it's very easy for a non-security uh, professional to see if there might be an attack vector there or not. Okay, I just want to read out uh, your uh, question. Do you think that non-security professionals such as Dev or QA can perform fast testing to discover security defect flaws? Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, Alper, I want to thank you for dedicating the time and effort to conduct uh, this session. It was great and personally I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and uh, have a good rest of the day. Yes, thank you did. very much. Bye-bye.